going to restart. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome to the first in the Ask a Teen virtual series. We're really glad that you are here tonight. If you are here as a participant and we want you to do two things for me first, make sure that your microphone is muted and that your video is off. The session is being recorded. So we want to make sure that we're not accidentally capturing anybody's image. And we ask that you keep your videos off and your microphones muted during this session. So again, we don't capture anything, but also so that we can make sure to hear our presenters. If you have questions, you should be able to tap, uh, type them right into the chat box and we'll be able to see them. We are gonna do a question answer session at the end of tonight, once each of our panelists has had a chance to present to you. So type your questions in as you have them and then we'll go through them later. You should see a poll on your screen. If you have not yet responded to that, if you will please take just a few seconds and answer those three questions. I'm gonna turn that off in just about 30 seconds and then we will get started on tonight. All right, thank you all very much for answering that survey. I'll go ahead and let you see your, see some of the results. Looks like most of you feel like you have a pretty moderate knowledge of animal welfare and enrichment careers. You feel like you know a little bit about how to pursue those careers. And you have lots of interest in pursuing those careers, which is excellent news. You are in the right place tonight. So we are going to go ahead and get started. We are going to begin with Kevin Ross, who's from the Oregon Coast Aquarium. And Kevin, if you would like to take it away, you may. Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm uh, one of the aquarists here at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Uh, being an aquarist, I'm responsible for the caretaking of all the fish and invertebrates at, at the facility here. Um, so I have to monitor everything from tank cleanliness, water quality, diets, uh, enrichment, and um, recognize health concerns as they come up as well. Uh, so just like most animals under human care, uh, we provide all of our uh, marine animals with some form of enrichment. Um, and because I'm the primary aquarist for our giant Pacific octopus here at the aquarium, I have a great example of that to share with you guys. Um, research shows that the giant Pacific octopus has the intelligence comparable to uh, cats and dogs. Um, so because of this, we, uh, we have to, uh, it's important that we constantly uh, stimulate them with enrichment um, so that they're constantly doing something like they would be in nature. Um, and uh, one of my favorite enrichment items for our octopus here at the aquarium is uh, this jar here. Um, pretty, pretty straightforward, but uh, we'll just take uh, one of their favorite food items, um, generally crab, and we'll put it inside this jar here and close it up. Um, and usually within about 10 or 15 minutes of, of handing this item to the octo, they're able to figure out how to take the top off and grab the crab out. So when you're talking about a mollusk or essentially a snail, figuring out how to open a jar, it's really, really cool to see. So that's one of my favorite ones to do for them. Um, I have a lot of other different uh, toys and puzzles and stuff that I have them do, um, but I'll generally start them with this guy here. And then, um, so it's a good way to uh, stimulate them um, that way. Um, and then once a week, I'll do a uh, health checkup on our Octos. Um, and so I use this tool here, which we call the um, Octo Matrix. Um, so sorry, you probably can't see it very well on the screen here, but uh, down on this row here, I have a bunch of characteristics that I'm looking for, and it's on a number scale of one to four. So Four is the worst condition in all these characteristics, and one is the best. Um, 
So once a week, I'll be going through all these. So it's like skin condition, skin coloration, whether they're responding to our stimuli, so our toys, um, and if they're eating all the food items that they're offered. Um, this is a nice tool to use because as the octo, um, or as the numbers here increase towards four, um, it gives me an idea that uh, there could be a health concern, um, but it's also really nice um, for us to get an idea when the uh, octos are heading towards senescence or they're ready to mate. Um, when they're ready to mate, they'll just stop doing everything else and they'll focus just on, on the mating. Um, and so they'll start giving um, indicators of that within this matrix. Um, so as my numbers are starting to go up, then I can um, go to my curator and, and then suggest that uh, it's probably time to return them back to the ocean. So we try and get them out to, back to the ocean to um, give them the best possible chance to find a mate and uh, create some more baby octos for us here on the coast. So uh, this is a pretty cool uh, tool that actually it just got um, accepted for publication as well. So it's actually been shown to uh, be very accurate. Um, and uh, one of our aquarists from a couple years ago with our veterinarian actually uh, created this matrix. So it's kind of cool that this is kind of getting out there now as a tool that others can use uh, to, to have a health checkup on their octos. So yeah. Um, and then uh, to get into this field of work, um, I went to the university, got a bachelor's in biology with an emphasis in fisheries. Um, during my four years of college, I was also working at uh, PetSmart uh, part-time in the pet care department and so I was helping uh, customers um, set up fish tanks and sell them fish and stuff for the fish tanks. So that's initially where my love of fish and invertebrates started and then um, after I graduated uh, college I uh, looked around online and I found that Oregon Coast Aquarium was offering an internship. Uh, so I applied for that and got accepted into the internship and after that, I was fortunate enough to get hired permanently here. So I got to stay after my internship, which is really cool. Um, so, uh, you know, education is definitely a minimum requirement on most of these uh, facilities, uh, but also it's important to make sure that you guys are out there getting uh, internship experience or like volunteer experience because uh, you, you definitely want to have as much experience as you can to going into the uh, uh, job uh, application process. Um, and I also like to point out, you know, if you're interested in fish and invertebrate uh, keeping uh, here on the Oregon coast in our community college, we off also offer a aquarium science program, which is, uh, it's a two year program. Uh, so it's a lot quicker and more direct route into this field. Um, if, if you didn't want to do the four years at university, uh, I, I love to suggest that to people because um, it gets you more skills in this field and uh, gets you through school faster as well. So sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> um, and so uh, to be an aquarist, um, another important skill that uh, I always try and tell people to get uh, working on is diving. Uh, generally, most facilities are going to want you to know how to dive and uh, be able to do it as well. Um, so as you can see behind me here, I got our shark exhibit, um, which uh, to be able to dive in there is a great experience. Uh, so uh, it's, it's fun to be able to get in there and, and do uh, husbandry work, uh, cleaning, siphoning and all that, and, and to just be with the sharks and stuff. So um, yeah, so whether you, you're diving now or you've dove in the past, um, uh, definitely keep doing that if you can and, and getting more dive experience on top of the uh, volunteering and, and interning and, and stuff as well. Um, so and in, in this job you're going to work independently a lot of the times but you also need to be a team player. So um, a lot of facilities are going to be looking for someone who can balance both of those aspects being an independent worker and a team player. Um, and I guess I'll just close with, uh, if you really enjoy being near the water or in the water um, and you have an interest in ocean conservation, uh, being an aquarist is a uh, really rewarding uh, job to, to look for.
So yeah, I think that'll be all I have to share. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was very helpful. For those of you who are attendees, if you have questions for Kevin or about aquariums in general, you can go ahead and enter them into the chat box and we'll answer those at the end of the session. Next up, we have Jenny Thum Thuman, um, who is from the Cosley Zoo. Just gonna get this. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? So, hi, I'm Jenny. I'm from Cosley Zoo out here in Wheaton, Illinois. Um, we are a small five-acre zoo, mostly native wildlife. Um, a lot of our wildlife has been rehabbed, so they're here with their second chance. They're a great um, conversation starter to connect people with, with animals that they commonly find here in their own backyard, and we can have the conversations about how we impact them and how they impact our lives every day and hopefully make people see some different changes or different behaviors that they could pursue that would benefit wildlife um, in our area. So I am the lead keeper and animal welfare coordinator. Uh, as part of my lead keeper position, I oversee all of the keepers here at the zoo. We have two full-time and seven part-time keepers who work daily with all of the animals here at the zoo. Uh, we don't have any specialized areas. Everybody switches their schedules um, and their areas uh, daily so that we all stay relevant in all the areas. We work with the deer and the coyote, the salamanders, um, and in some of our smaller invertebrates uh, that we use in programs. We don't only see, um, I don't only oversee the keepers, I work side by side with them. So I'm out doing chores with them, uh, working in the areas. I also develop um, and implement new animal program components. So the animal welfare program that we have here at the zoo took two years to develop with a lot of help and input from the keepers. Um, but I got to spearhead that and I learned a ton, which was awesome. I'm also the representative for Cosley Zoo in the safe um, saving Animals from Extinction program with the American Turtles. Uh, we've had a 20-year uh, partnership with the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County where we've been head starting Blanding's Turtles, which are pretty, they're endangered here in our state. Um, and we've been part of the program that's released 3,000 individuals back to the wild. Um, we just recently got another 80 uh, hatchlings in. I'm also the lead for our diversity, equity, and inclusion team, as well as our wild uh, welfare assessment team. And I also oversee the volunteer and internship programs in our animal care department. For my animal welfare coordinator position, um, I am responsible for the behavioral health of the animals here at the zoo. Um, this includes doing regular welfare assessments, um, much like Kevin was talking about um, with a rating system, you can track trends in, in how the animals are responding to stimulus or um, if they're having a life event, they've just given birth, um, how quickly they're rebounding from that and getting back to normal. Are the offspring kind of reaching their milestones they should be reaching? Um, so we have something very similar set up with metrics that we use to um, really see in a snapshot how the animals are doing. Um, I'm responsible for training all of the keepers on that and we've integrated all of our buildings and grounds and guest services department and education department into that welfare program. Um, I'm also responsible for making sure that we have good clear communication between all departments regarding um, any welfare concerns that may come up. Um, sometimes People will ask a question just because they don't understand, or sometimes it's just an opportunity for us to look at what we're doing and do a little bit better. Um, and then starting to use some different technology like Zoom Monitor to um, develop projects and go collect data on our animals so that we know um, what normal is for them and then we can set behavioral goals for them um, and help them build some resilience uh, and really act naturally, if you will. Um, Cosley Zoo is pretty small. We're five acres. Um, we, before COVID happened, we were seeing about 170,000 guests per year. And um, 
this is kind of how my position helps COSLI reach its mission. Um, if animals are not behaving naturally or if there's a lot of um, outward signals that the animal may not be in good health, people are A, not going to come through your gate. You're not going to be able to share your mission. Um, they're not going to infer that these animals have a good life experience or good welfare. Um, and they're not going to think of you as a resource in the community. So by focusing our efforts on our welfare program and our enrichment and training programs, um, we ensure that the animals in our collection represent their wild counterparts um, as naturally as possible. And again, that allows us to have those conversations with folks on how they're impacting their wildlife in their, in their backyards and um, things that they could do to make it better for the animals that they share space with. For me, I had a non-traditional entry into the field. I started um, by attending school. I attended a trade school and I was going to be a cook. Um, I found out pretty quickly I had no passion for that. So I went to community college and got a lot of my credits out of the way. I learned how I need to learn, um, which was really important for me. I'm a hands-on learner. I need to see it and do it. I can't just read it. Um, and I was able to transfer to um, a college up in Maine that specialized in wildlife um, and environmental sciences. Um, so I got my bachelor's there. And then while I was working um, full time at my first zoo, I also um, applied for and worked to achieve my master's degree. Um, one of the things that I did while I was in school that I think is super important, um, I did internships in between my junior and senior year of college so that I knew really where I was going once I graduated. And I was able to take the experience I had in the summer between junior and senior year, and I was able to focus my senior year on some specialties that uh, benefited me later on um, once I graduated. So I would recommend um, definitely looking at volunteer opportunities and definitely looking at internships prior to your graduation um, as a definite benefit. Uh, some of those experiences, you know, I worked at Buttonwood Park Zoo in uh, Massachusetts. That, that was the zoo that I visited growing up. Um, I was in their animal care department. I started in the aquatics building and moved all around the whole zoo. Um, I was also a veterinary assistant at a, a small animal hospital. And then I got lucky and I got hired on at Buttonwood. Um, and I worked there until I moved out to the Chicago area. And uh, once I made it out here, um, before becoming a keeper here at Cosley, I worked um, as a volunteer at the Shed Aquarium in their animal programs department. And then also as a animal care technician at uh, Willowbrook Wildlife Center, which is a, a rehab. So we did a lot of lots of learning there as well. Um, so if you are trying to figure out if this field is for you, if you love animals, you love helping people connect with the animals, if you like working with a diverse group of people who share your, your passions, I would say this field is definitely for you. Um, and then just start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. Always try to um, put yourself in the best position possible. Um, volunteering is wildly helpful. Um, you, you can volunteer at pet shelters, um, working with cats and dogs. If you have the ability to volunteer at a horse barn or um, your local zoo, any and all of those things um, will definitely get you a benefited um, experience in the future. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Jenny, for attendees. If you have questions, I saw a few come through during Jenny's speech, but if you have other questions, feel free to enter those into the chat box. Next up, we have Lacey Hickel, who is from the Chattanooga Zoo. Hi guys, um, uh, like Katie mentioned, I am from the Chattanooga Zoo, that's in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, I uh, started my career off uh, as a zookeeper. Um, when I was an undergrad, 
Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. When I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to go into biology. I knew I loved animals. I'd gone to zoos all growing up. Um, so I knew I kind of wanted to do something in the bio biology field, but I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do um, with, my, with my degree. Um, so I did a lot of volunteering um, at animal shelters, um, zoos, um, just trying to get as much experience. I worked with professors in their labs to see if maybe I had a passion for genetics. I didn't, um, <laughs> but it was a great experience to kind of to see what was out there career-wise. Um, and eventually I uh, started volunteering in the education department at the Toledo Zoo, uh, which was near where I was going to do a, getting my bachelor's degree. And I loved it. I loved being in the zoo. I loved being surrounded by zoo people. It, you know, it really kind of sparked that passion for me. Um, and once I graduated with my bachelor's degree in biology, um, I went on to do, to do internships and volunteers just like uh, Kevin and Jenny have mentioned they did as well, um, which was a great foot in the door to kind of um, learn more about the zoo field and get in at zoos. Um, I did uh, get hired uh, shortly after my second internship um, to become an animal care professional. Um, and I was a keeper for just under 10 years um, before I had a little bit of a career switch. Um, I loved working in zoos, uh, but I found that I was becoming more passionate about the medical side of things. Um, so about seven and a half, eight-ish years into my zookeeping career, I actually went back to school to get my associates in veterinary technology. Um, so I actually became a, a veterinary technician um, and then proceeded to become a vet tech in a zoo instead of just a zookeeper. Um, although day in and day out, it's, they're very similar. I still find myself doing a lot of keeper work um, as a vet tech. And it was shortly after graduating with my uh, vet tech degree and passing my boards um, that I started here at the Chattanooga Zoo. Um, and I've been here for about seven and a half years. Um, my position has grown and changed uh, over the past uh, seven and a half years that I've been here. Um, I initially was hired just to be a vet tech, not just a vet tech, but to be a vet tech as well as the registrar here at the zoo. Um, so I was primarily focused on making sure animals' health and records uh, stayed um, up to date and the animals were getting the veterinary care that, that they needed. And a huge part of that um, was also making sure that our training program um, was benefiting the animals to, to help them give um, have better uh, access and participate in their own health care, um, as well as making sure our enrichment program was safe. Um, so, you know, enrichment is wonderful. It stimulates our animals, but there is a little bit of risk there. Uh, so my role in our enrichment program as the vet tech was to make sure that our enrichment program um, is not only stimulating and interesting, but also safe for our animals um, as well and doesn't jeopardize uh, their health. Um, and my current title is a mouthful. Uh, it is Assistant Curator and Manager of Animal Health and Records, uh, which kind of encompasses a lot of different things. Um, one of the things I love most about working in a smaller zoo is that we all kind of get to do a little bit of everything that, that uh, we are passionate about in, in the zoo world. Um, so we get to do a dabble in a little bit of everything. So my role here um, encompasses a wide variety of things. Um, not only am I still one of the vet techs and still very much involved in the animal health department, but I also help our general curator um, manage the animal husbandry department. Uh, so I help oversee keepers. I help make animal uh, husbandry decisions to make sure our animals are receiving the best care. Um, I also oversee our records, so records are very important to look for those trends and to, and to see that data um, are very, so animal records are very important uh, for good care for our animals, um, so I oversee those. Um, I also help oversee our nutrition department, um, so I help formulate diets along with the rest of our animal care and veterinary team um, and help, help with nutrition. Um, I also help our keepers with our training in enrichment. Um, so we have a training in enrichment coordinator um, who is a keeper here as well, but I also help her kind of manage those programs and make sure um, all of our keepers are meeting their goals. 
Um, and that all together is kind of underneath animal welfare. So lots of things go into providing animals with opportunities for good welfare. Uh, proper health care, good nutrition, training programs, enrichment programs, um, well-trained keeper staff, keepers who are passionate about their jobs. Um, that all kind of helps make sure our animals um, have the opportunity to live their best lives. Um, so I also oversee an animal welfare program, which is kind of helping uh, dove, dovetails nicely into the rest of my field. So I kind of dabble into everything. So um, when the zoo was needing someone to oversee our animal welfare program, it just, it kind of was obvious that it, it should be me. So it was kind of a roundabout way um, that I kind of got involved into animal welfare. Um, but I do oversee our animal welfare program um, and that is probably day to day what takes up uh, what I spend most of my time on. Um, and that's assessing animals welfare, checking in with keepers to make sure everyone is doing well. Um, it's also leading our animal welfare committee meetings um, and then really taking a critical eye on, on the care that we are providing our animals um, and making sure that we are doing the best that we can do uh, for our animals here. Um, animal welfare is one of one of those things where it's never like it's never a checkbox where you're like, okay, they're good, time to move on. We're done there. It's one of those things that you constantly need to be pushing and looking for to make sure that um, there are, that you're doing what you need to do and making sure the animals are doing well. Um, and then looking for those those things where you can do it a little bit better. There's always room for improvement um, when it comes to caring for animals. Um, and even in their animal in their welfare. Um, so it's always kind of taking a critical eye at those things and see where can you where can you do things better? Are you staying up to date with current research? Um, so I read a lot of articles in scientific research on animal behavior, um, animal health, nutrition, and welfare, um, just because it all plays um, uh, plays a, a part in providing animals uh, with opportunities to, for good welfare. Um, so it's, it's kind of, um, I do a lot <laughs> of things, uh, but I don't do it alone. Um, we are, we are a small zoo, but we are a very close knit team. So, um, there's a lot of things I oversee and do, but I could not do any of it without my, uh, the wonderful staff here at the Chattanooga Zoo. Um, and that kind of goes into, you know, our mission of, you know, we are very big into being a resource in the community and community involvement. Um, so by my, my role here of making sure our animals are healthy and well cared for um, really helps our educators be able to do outreach. It makes our, you know, our guests that come through the doors enjoy their experience and learn about our, an our animals. It helps them exhibit natural behaviors so guests can see um, the, the natural behaviors that they would be exhibiting um, in, in our care as well as uh, in, in their natural habitats. Um, so, you know, we are really community focused. Uh, so my job here is just kind of helping make everything, everything go smoothly and that the community has a, a wonderful resource here. Um, I would probably say the best advice I'd have for, for high school students um, or college students who are considering a career in, in zoos or um, particularly with animal welfare is it's so broad. Um, there's so many different aspects of that. Uh, just go out there, talk to people, come to, you know, go to talks like this, um, visit your local zoos uh, or animal shelters. Um, there's so many different facets to this, to this career field um, that just kind of find out what little part that you're really passionate about and um, what really sparks your interest and then volunteer and um, do internships and just kind of explore all the different opportunities out there. You never kind of, you never quite know where, where life will take you. I didn't think I would be where I am now, um, you know, a lot of years ago when I was back when I was your age, I didn't, I, was, I assumed I'd probably be a keeper and I'd still be a keeper now. And um, so I didn't really know where exactly where I would be going uh when i was when i was a lot younger so just kind of see where life will take you and kind of keep your doors open and keep your options open and explore everything that's out there so i think i think that's it thank you very much lacy that was awesome so again if you have any questions for lacy if you will please put those into the chat box our fourth panelist is stephanie chandler who is joining us from the akron zoo 
Give me a second. Okay. So yes, I am Stephanie Chandler and I am the Behavioral Husbandry Manager at the Akron Zoo. Um, so what does Behavioral Husbandry Manager mean? Um, I think nobody really knows the answer to that, um, but some days, well, specifically it means um, and this is where it gets tricky, um, that I oversee our enrichment and our training programs for all of the animals at the zoo. Um, it means that I oversee our behavioral observations and research that goes on at the zoo. And then I also oversee our animal welfare program and all of our animal welfare assessments. So what does that mean? That means some days I get to go out and see our animals engaging in somewhat natural behaviors, I suppose, um, that's play, <laughs> um, and engaging with our visitors. Other days, I get to participate um, and help our keepers in some training projects that we might have going on. Turns out it's a lot easier to target train a Galapagos tortoise than it is to pick them up and carry them inside. Um, so that uh, was a fun project to um, find motivation for tortoises. Um, other times, I am sitting behind a computer. This keeper here is actually collecting data for me. I'm using the Zoo Monitor app. And then all of that data, um, I get to sort through and sift through and kind of figure out what it's telling us about how the animals are living their lives. And then still on other days, I take an even bigger step back and I am looking at the overall wellness of all of the animals at our zoo. Um, so while this is only a picture of one of our areas, um, I'm looking at the animals' interactions with their habitat, with the habitat next to them, with what's in nature, um, with who they live with, with the visitors, with the public, what their healthcare is, all of those things go into our animal welfare assessment. So when it comes to the Akron Zoo mission, um, our mission is to connect, wild, connect your life to wildlife while inspiring lifelong learning and conservation action. And the way I do that through my job is that I tell the stories of the animals. So I talk about uh, grizzly bear siblings that are learning or had to learn how to play nice with each other. Um, and we can relate that to many parents, many aunts and uncles out there, many uh, kids with sisters, brothers, cousins. Um, and so talking about the importance of working on that relationship between the animals and that they can work together, live together, um, all of those things. Um, I get to talk to the guests of, or to our guests about um, enrichment. You heard um, about octopus a little bit ago. So here is one of our favorite octopus enrichments that kids um, and adults relate to. It's a hamster ball with Mr. Potato Head and inside Mr. Potato Head was lunch. And so you get, you can connect with, I'm able to connect with our visitors and our guests when they can see something that they recognize and talk about the intelligence of the octopus and how they're able to manipulate um, different objects and things like that. So by telling those stories, um, just by having an animal in front of me um, really helps um, inspire that lifelong learning. Um, and then finally, um, we also do training talks at the Akron Zoo. So this is just two of the examples of types of training that we do in front of our guests. And this gives um, the entire zoo, whether it's myself speaking, whether it's our education department, our animal care staff, um, the opportunity, we have a captive audience because they're there to see the animals um, and see the animals um, exhibit behaviors that are involved in their medical care. But we also get to tell them the animal stories and how the animals are participating in their own um, health care and how they're building relationships with our staff. Um, so my school and career experience is not short. Um, so I started out with an undergraduate degree in biology and psychology. Um, I went to a liberal arts school, but focused all of my free time in the sciences. Um, I then did a zoo internship um, right out of college. It was 10 weeks at a zoo near where I grew up. 
I actually did not do anything um, prior to um, going to college in the zoos. I knew I was interested in working with animals, but I didn't know what that meant and I didn't know what options were out there. Um, following the internship, I actually um, started at the local university as a research associate in their psychology department and I worked with zebra finches for a year. Um, and learning all about or helping study their vocalizations and their learning patterns. Um, after that, I went back to school. Um, I decided I wanted to be more hands-on with the animals. Um, so I have a master's degree in psychology and that's through um, Hunter College and the Animal Behavior and Conservation Program um, in New York City. Um, during my time, I think it all, it all gets blurry. Um, but after that, I continued to volunteer at some local zoos and also started taking AZA professional development courses where I met professionals in the field, um, which led me to the Toledo Zoo, um, where I was a volunteer for three years. Um, I also was a temporary keeper there by being on grounds and knowing the staff and them knowing me. I was able to um, fill in as a temporary keeper two separate times. Um, and then I got to volunteer some more when those jobs ended. And then seven or eight years after I graduated with my master's degree, I got a big girl job at the Akron Zoo. So there is a lot of um, experience that went in, unpaid experience that went into where I am today. Um, why this career? Um, I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, I get to do a little bit of everything and I get to see a little bit of everything. So while this, this couple of these picture, this next picture isn't me, um, it is the one-on-one -on -one relationships that um, somebody in my position gets to build with our animals. So we have that one-on-one -on -one or been working with both grizzly bears and the keepers. It's a very very close um, relationship that I get to build. Um, other times, it's connecting our guests with our endangered species. So we house red wolves and I get to talk to our guests about their, their story and how endangered they are and how critical it is that we preserve their habitat and think about what we're doing in our own backyards. Um, and have that connection um, with nature. And then other times, like I said, it's the, it's the big picture stuff. Um, I'm looking at, again, everything from the animal interactions with our guests to each other, to what their nutrition um, might be indicating in their healthcare, all sorts of stuff with our welfare assessments. Um, and I'm not talking too much about our welfare assessments, um, but I think Marique may, may talk about that a little bit more and you've heard a little bit already about what some other people are doing, but really looking at that big picture um, situation. And finally, what my advice is to you, um, it's gonna be volunteer. I think everybody um, knows that you've got to get out there, you've got to meet people, you've got to find out what you like and what you don't like, um, and you need to get recognized. So the zoo field is very small um, and just sitting here realizing that Lacey was at the Toledo Zoo. Um, not sure when, but our paths may or may not have crossed with um, similar or with the same staff. And Marique, who is about to speak after me, she and I went through grad school together. So it is a very small world out there. Um, so my second piece of advice is to leave a good impression. Um, even if you find out that the experience that you are um, in the middle of, that you volunteered for, it's a part-time job that you don't necessarily think that's what you want to do, um, you want to leave a good impression because you don't know who might know who. Um, and that gets around um, and you can have some really great opportunities just by leaving a good impression. So that's with your bosses, your coworkers, teachers in school right now, your professors, um, everybody. Um, and then finally, um, you need to have fun. So you got to find something that is fun to do um, while sitting behind a desk isn't necessary, behind a computer at a desk isn't always the most fun. Um, I also get to go out and watch our grizzly bears um, wrestle like toddlers. So 
So those are my pieces of advice, and that is my contact information if anybody has any other questions. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. So once again, if you have questions, if you will go ahead and put them into the chat box, we'll get to those in just a minute. But first we're going to hear from our fifth panelist who is Marie Gardner, who is from Zoo Atlanta. Hey everybody. Um, I am Dr. Marie Gardner, as Katie just said, and I um, am the Associate Curator of Animal Welfare at Zoo Atlanta. So, what does that mean? Um, basically, I started there um, to create a formal animal welfare program. Um, obviously, we're um, an accredited zoo, and so our keepers are already very concerned with the welfare of our animals, is what they do day in, day out. And I was hired to kind of create a policy and just a formal on paper program that we could follow that incorporated what they were already doing and then any new ideas. Um, welfare assessments, you've heard this quite a few times now. Um, this has actually become institutionalized across the AZA now, um, which is why you've heard it. So we're all required to do these. And so I created the welfare assessment program for the zoo. And again, it's for every single animal. So if you think about a welfare assessment for an ape, you might think that's not so hard. But then when you think um, about some of the other animals we keep in zoos, like fish um, or herpetology, where we actually don't have as much research on them, sometimes people think, well, that's a lot harder. So how can we do that? And so as you heard from other people, we are doing that. And we are able to assess these things. Um, I am a researcher, basically, I'm a scientist, and so I do a lot of research at the zoo that's uh, welfare-based, um, and that can be anything from just watching animals, as Stephanie was talking about, and recording what they're doing, to experimental things where we're asking them to um, interact with an item, and we can measure how they react to that item, and there's a lot more going on there. We can also look at cognitive abilities and um, figure out how animals are feeling and thinking, and that's all related to welfare. So Zoo Atlanta's mission is um, right here, and it's really um, about conservation, research, uh, education, engaging experiences, very similar to what everyone else said. Zoos are conservation organizations. And so um, we're really trying to get at that in a lot of different ways. So how I get at that is, um, so the welfare part, very directly related. So um, welfare is directly related actually to conservation. Um, the really obvious example of that is captive breeding. Um, so when we um, match animals up and make sure that we are getting a really good population that um, we often release to the wild, so we want them to survive. Um, and then research. So Zoo Atlanta since the 80s has been very interested in research. In the 80s, um, we were ranked as the worst zoo uh, in the country. And the, they got in a new director and he said, let's fix this. And one of the ways he wanted to fix it was being able to use evidence-based um, research to really look at what we're doing and make changes based on that. And so since that time, we've been collecting data um, on a lot of our animals. Um, the most well-known is our gorilla program. And we used to have the most gorillas. Um, we used to have 20, now we have 16 or 17 gorillas. Um, and we have data for 20 years more on, on these animals. So that's a really nice um, data set that you don't often see. Um, education, um, I work with our education department to um, get people experiences that really tie them and make them want to take that conservation action. Um, but I also just talk to visitors when they come into the zoo and they see me doing my work, they wanna know what I'm doing and I'll let them know. Um, I also give uh, research tours and um, just talk to people about what welfare means and how we take it seriously with all our animals. And that's the same for engaging experiences as well. So I also came about this in a little odd way. I've always loved animals ever since I was a little kid and any animals, when I was a little kid, one of my favorite animals was a stonefly. So it was never really specific, um, but I never knew it, it could be a career. I just had, I didn't know. So when I first got my bachelor's degree, I was always interested in the mind. And so I got a degree in psychology, but it was human psychology. So I didn't, I don't even know if there were animal courses available to me at that time. Um, so I didn't take any. <laughs> um, and then I just really liked to read. So I got a master's degree in English, completely unrelated to any of this. And at that point I ended up becoming an editor and I was an editor for 10 years. And I realized I wasn't really fulfilled by that career. And I thought, well, 
what can I do with my life? I don't know what to do. And I was watching Animal Planet one day, seriously. And I was like, wait, I want to do that. It was just people interacting with animals. I don't know what show it was. And I didn't know what that was though. So um, I'll get back to it. But so I, I started there with, I don't know what to do. How do I pursue that? And I'll get to that in a sec. So I ended up getting a, a psychology degree, as Stephanie mentioned, at Hunter College, um, which focused in animal behavior. And that just really made me have so many more questions. So I ended up going for my doctorate. Um, it was also in psychology. I'm very interested in the mind. And, um, and that was focused on animals as well. So my master's research was with snow leopards at the Bronx Zoo. And I wanted to know if you could measure personality in snow leopards. And I think these pictures kind of show you can. Um, the one up top is Leo. And then we have Tasha on the bottom there. And then we have a, um, one of the cubs there on the right. And I did find that you can measure personality in snow leopards. And I used a survey to find that, ask the keepers um, what they knew because the keepers know their animals best. And so I could never do any of my research without keepers. And so they filled that out for me. And I also did a novel object test to find out if I give them something they've never seen before, how do they react to it? And they were pretty interested in it, um, but some of them avoided it. And that really does talk about personality. So I was really interested in personality. So I just pursued that for my doctorate. And I just looked at more cats because I really like cats. And um, I looked at five different species of cat and I found that, yeah, you can measure personality in cats. So there's a lot of research in apes and humans, but also there's personality actually in a lot of animals, including things like water striders and fish, things that people would say, wait, what? But there are, we've measured it. And then I started to get really interested in welfare. So I wanted to know, is personality related to well-being? So it is in humans and it is in apes. And sure enough, it is in cats as well and a lot of other species. <laughs> and those are my study subjects, three or some of them, three very cute Scottish wild uh, cat kittens. So back before when I didn't know really what to do, I started volunteering at a cat shelter. I knew I liked cats. I didn't know what part of working with animals I wanted to do, so I did that. I did that, I ended up there for four years. Um, and then I just took a class at Hunter, I took one class, I wasn't enrolled, but they had that really cool animal behavior program and I was hooked. I loved it. I loved the class. I loved studying. I loved working at the, the shelter. And so that was, that was that. So then my career, I did my research at the Bronx Zoo for my master's, my doctoral research at the Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park in Scotland. And then I got a postdoc fellow at uh, Philadelphia Zoo. So that was a research position. And I was hired to research. They have a, um, a trail system that is elevated and goes all around the zoo. And I was hired to find out if the animals liked it. And that was really cool. <laughs> it was so much fun to you know, just measure that. Do they like the trail? Um, and then I got hired into Atlanta. Um, and that was to create that formal program. And um, I was lucky enough to then get a job there. Um, and that's where I am now. So this career is great. It's fantastic. I, it's so much fun. I think you've probably gotten that from all of us speaking that we, you know, we're all like, this is so much fun. <laughs> you know, we learn so much. It's so rewarding because you get to work with the animals and you get to see changes that you can implement. Um, and it's challenging, which is great. It makes you really think and it makes you, um, you know, try to come up with new ideas and how can I help these animals and do better? Um, it is fun. It really is. Um, you just sit there. I mean, look at that, that face. Like you just sit there and watch animals record their behaviors. It's so much fun, right? It's great. Um, and then what's really good about the, this field is that there's so much to study. There's so much we haven't looked at. So we have a lot of data on apes. We have a lot of research on apes, but we still don't know everything about them. But that's such a studied species. There are so many species we know so little about that you could almost pick anything and be able to study that. And there's something in there that you can come up with yourself that hasn't been studied yet. And then, you know, I really feel that we have a responsibility to these animals um, and to our world. Um, we are losing habitat. Um, we are losing animals. And we need to take care of them um, because we can. And so if you care about that and you want to conserve animals, as other people have said, this is the field for you. And you know, if you love animals, this is a great field to go into. In any of these ways, you can see there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, in terms of advice, basically the same as everyone else, just get a lot of experience. So if you know what animal you wanna work with, that's great. But if you don't, just work with a lot of animals. You'll figure out which one you wanna work with. Um, 
And then you don't only have to work with one animal either, but you can hone your, your skills that way. In terms of what I do, it is good to get primate experience. Just totally honestly, that's what got me my job. Even though I was focused on cats, I made sure I you know, did other research with friends who were doing primate research. So I could get that on my resume because people love primates and they, that does resonate with a lot of people. Of course, it depends if you're going to go work at an aquarium, they're not going to care so much. Um, but at zoos, they're going to care a little bit more about primates. So um, it's always good to have some experience with primates as well as whatever other animals you're interested in. And yeah, just to reiterate, there is so much, so much out there, so many species, so much you can do that it's just a great field to join. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. We do have some questions, so we'll go through those. There were, for everybody, there were multiple co questions about colleges, mostly how did you decide on the college that you went to? What drew you to that school? Was it the program, the history of the school, that sort of thing? I'll start since I'm still unmuted. Um, I went to Hunter College um, because I lived there and because I was working in a completely different field and I was switching careers, I needed to keep my job and work through school. So it was really lucky that Hunter had that animal behavior program where I was and where I was working. But now I tell everyone to go there because I loved it. I thought it was a great school and a great opportunity. Um, so that's how I, that's how I picked that school. But now there's a lot more to available than when, what was available when I was looking at schools. So I think you want to look for people you want to work with. Are the professors there studying something you're interested in? And can, yeah, convenience. Can you afford to go move somewhere else and go to school? And if you can't, why not just stay where you are and, and get that experience where you are? I actually uh, transferred halfway through getting my undergrad degree. I started off at the University of Miami in Florida and I went there because it's a very prestigious university and I got early acceptance and I get there and find out that it wasn't the right school for me. Um, and I transferred halfway through getting my undergrad degree to a smaller state university in Ohio. Um, I actually went to Bowling Green State University uh, and that is where I got my bachelor's degree in biology. Um, and it was such a better fit for me. It was a smaller school. Um, but one of the deciding factors when I decided to transfer as to where I went was I just looked through the course catalog and was there enough courses? Was there enough professors there that I wanted to learn from and things I wanted to learn there? Um, so I, I, my advice for choosing universities is prestige isn't always what you need to go for. It's finding those good fits and finding the right home. And even if that is a state school versus a very prestigious private university, um, it's it kind of just find what's find what's best for, best for you and go with your gut um, for what you what you feel comfortable with and make sure that you know the courses there are something that you're passionate about and that you're interested in. Okay, if I could just add one thing real quick, adding on to that. Some of those really prestigious schools are also very traditional thinking. So I think it's a really good point that Lacey brings up. It, prestige is not necessarily the first, the first thing you should look at because um, you might find a program somewhere else is more geared towards what you're interested in. That actually feeds in well to the next question. For teens that are being homeschooled, do you, would you say that they would be considered the same way for the same zoo positions? Or do you think that would impact their ability to pursue these careers? So um, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I think I, I think it goes back to experience. Um, so the Akron Zoo has actually, um, in the past, had a homeschool enrichment program for teens. Um, where they have come in and they have learned, um, and I've worked with um, our education department um, about enrichment and developing programs and um, building enrichment and things like that. So I think it's more about the experience that they're getting in, in that field. So whether it's working or volunteering at a shelter or working at a pet store, um, wildlife um, rehab, something like that is really going to be what um, institutions, uh, zoological institutions are looking for, um, at least from um, my history. Awesome.
awesome. Thank you very much. The Sorry, I muted myself. The next question is for those um, who are doing those welfare assessments, what do you do when one of those comes back wrong or shows a potential problem? Okay, I'll answer. <laughs> um, that, that's a great question. Um, and so we have a system in place where we'll get a red flag if something comes in low enough. And then there are all sorts of things. So the first thing we'll do is we just meet, like the team involved in the care of that animal will meet and we discuss what we think is going on. And then sometimes it's easy because we know what's going on. Um, you know, we have an animal that has a known medical condition. So we, we know, okay, they're on this med, maybe they need a different med or something like that. Sometimes we don't know at all. And that's one of the things that can spur research um, or it can also spur kind of uh, really basic just observations. Um, and we'll try and brainstorm to say what's going on and then start testing different things to see what it is that that is going on. Once we know, then we can address it. Now, often we don't know. That's really happens a lot where we don't know. And that's when research can try and help get that bigger picture of, of what's going on. I can add on to that. Um, when we have a concern um, or something comes up, a lower number than we'd like to see. Uh, we do start sort of a, an investigation, if you will, and we look at the animal's whole history to see if this is something that's repeating, if it's seasonal or something that we've dealt with in the past. Um, being a small facility, we do have a little bit of turnover within our keepers. And so just making sure that we're referring to our records to make sure it's not something that's come up before. Um, and then move forward with research if necessary, um, specialized projects to collect data, um, and then always talking with our veterinarians to make sure that um, if it is something that is medical, we address it medically, or if it's management, we address it appropriately. Awesome, thank you very much. We have just um, a couple more questions. One for Kevin that came up repeatedly is people want to know more about where to get dive experience, especially as a teen. Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, so, all right, uh, that's a good question, yeah. Um, so uh, I got certified through PADI, and I know PADI has a lot of institutions around, so um, usually going on their webpage and seeing where they have classes to offer is a good start. Um, me personally actually didn't get dive certified until after I graduated college. So, um, it kind of shows like it, the paths could be different. Um, just knowing from my experience, I know if I would have had more dive experience previously, it would have helped. Um, but yeah, usually you'll do the, the PADI, um, classes and I believe that they offer youth classes too, where they'll help you help youth get into it. Um, you'll do a lot of the trainings at the pools and stuff. Um, so that's probably the best advice I could give on that one. All right, thank you. And then uh, as we wrap up, if you will each just uh, quickly reiterate the schools that you went to, the colleges and the universities, there were several questions where people just wanted a, a refresher of where you went to school so that they know where to look for themselves. start. Um, so my undergrad was actually St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, uh, pretty much on the Canadian border. Um, and that was just um, a school that I looked at and was interested in in high school. Um, no specific animal um, or interest. Um, for grad school, again, I went to Hunter College in New York City. And I chose that um, after looking through different programs and looking at the instructors and what their interests were. Uh, I went to uh, a local community college first and then transferred my credits to um, Unity College up in Maine. I chose Unity because it had an environmental, um, all its majors were environmentally uh, focused and the small class sizes and the hands-on learning was huge for me. Um, and then I did my 
master's degree through George Mason University, and I did that because I could do it remotely while I was still working full time. And uh, it was a partnership with uh, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, so it, it was a partnership. Um, so I got a lot of good experience through that. Um, the Animal Behavior Society has a list of universities that focus on animal behavior. I don't know how often they update it, but it's a good place to start. Um, and also, it's just a really good idea because even if a university is not known for it, to just look at departments. So look at biology, look at um, psychology, you can look at environmental because they might have a professor, one professor there doing what you want, and that, that's going to be helpful. Um, but obviously, I also went to Hunter, as I mentioned before, which is in New York City. It's part of the city university system, so it's really affordable, which is great. Um, and then my other universities weren't focused on animal stuff, although I will say that I went to the University of Maryland for my English degree. However, there are a lot of zoo people I know who went there for their biology degree. So there is a kind of zoo population that comes out of that university. And then um, I moved to Scotland for my doctorate because I wanted to work with a specific professor he did what I was interested in. So it's really great to look up specific people and then go to the university where they are. Um, I went to uh, University of Miami in Florida um, and then I transferred, like I mentioned, to Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, and that's where I got my bachelor's degree. Um, and then uh, when I went back to school to be a veterinary technician, I went to the Vet Tech Institute uh, very aptly named. Uh, it was a private school just for, uh, all they taught was for was vet tech programs um, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right, so I'll jump in. So yeah, I went to uh, my local community college to start my um, general education towards biology. So I was getting the uh, they call them geckers. So like your general biology and all that out of the way. And then I transferred to the university um, into the biology program and I looked on the catalog and it had, um, I knew I wanted to work with fish, but at that time I didn't want to move away from home. So I looked on their catalog and they had uh, biology with the emphasis in fisheries. And at that time I thought I'd be working at the fish hatcheries. Um, but then uh, once I got that done, then it, my path led me here. So. Um, but yeah, the biology with the fisheries helped as well. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for that information. And thank you everyone for attending today. We did, there were a few other questions that unfortunately we just didn't have time to get to today, but you should see a poll on your screen. It's the same three questions as you answered when we started the session. If you have not done so yet, if you'll please take a moment and fill that out for us. And then uh, if you'll join me in thanking our panelists for taking time out of their days tonight to talk to us about their experience and offer advice. This session has been recorded. So re a copy of the recording can be available. If you're a current teen volunteer or participant at your zoo, you can contact your program supervisor and they should be able to get you that link. Thank you all again. Hope you have a wonderful night and thanks for being here.